Um, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Billy Chen, and I'm going to be um, introducing Marina tonight. Um, first, I need to say the program is supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council and the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of Governor Andrew Cuomo and the New York State Legislature. And thanks to the Irwin S. Channon School of Architecture here at the Cooper Union, um, and Nadir Tarani and Elizabeth O'Donnell. The Architectural League additionally thanks its members whose support helps make this evening possible and other programs. We feel so fortunate to have Marina here tonight to speak. I first became aware of the work of Marina Tabasum more than 15 years ago when, as a juror for the Aga Khan Awards, I saw a startling project from a studio called Urbana. Part of the surprise was that it was a sophisticated private interior, and we had been looking at work that focused on public buildings, often of extremely simple construction. It was a wake-up for the jury who did not expect to see this level of detail and finesse. Some jurors felt that it was too personal, but I felt strongly that it was work that was done with love and a deep knowledge and acknowledgement of the place, the city of Dhaka. The A5 apartment. It was a space that was woven from a sensibility for detail that reminded me of Scarpa, a desire for the monumental that reminded me of Khan, and the emphatic embrace of cultural placemaking from the great Bangladeshi architect Muzarul Islam. Marina and her partner Kashef Chowdhury practiced as Urbana before she formed her own studio in 2005. In 2016, she was awarded the Aga Khan Prize in Architecture for her project, the Beit Our Ur Roof Mosque in Dhaka. It was built and supported by the community in which it lives. This is a building that is humble and powerful. Looking at this work causes me to reflect. As we all know, this is a time when we feel anger and confusion with what is happening in our own country and in the world. In the past, when as architects we might have asked ourselves, what can I make that represents my vision in the world? Today, we might ask ourselves, how can we be of use in this world? Marina Tabasan has taken this question to heart, and doing so makes work that represents her vision in the world. This work stands as a possible way forward for our practice that wants at once to be an art and a solution. And while her work reflects the influence of Scarpa and Khan, more than anyone else, it takes the message of Muzharul Islam and carries it forward. He said, one has to love his own land its people, and its culture, and think profoundly about these. The love of one's own land is the eternal source of creative power, which in turn makes a proper architect. May we all strive to be proper architects. Marina. Thank you, Marina. That was a beautiful introduction. Uh, I didn't know that you were <laughs> in the jury. Uh, in those days, probably, we didn't even have internet, so I had no clue about um, who was in the jury. And um, yeah, but it, it's a wonderful reminder. Thank you very much. Um, so, well, I come from Bangladesh. Um, I was born and brought up there. Um, so 
in a way, um, I have never really left. But then again, I claim that there was a lot of multiculturalism that was already there in our land. So I, I was in my school. My school was an American missionary school, and uh, the architecture school where I went, uh, it was established by Texas A&M. So there is a lot of American <laughs> things that uh, did get incorporated uh, over the years. So I don't know, probably a fusion. I don't know what kind of a fusion that would be. Um, so to start with, I was basically in the last few weeks uh, going through some of the older presentations that I did, uh, especially from the 2004, 2005, um, at that time, even before the financial crisis. So, uh, and I graduated from architecture in 1995. And at that time, uh, especially in Bangladesh, I think, like elsewhere in the world, uh, there was this boom going on in the real estate sector where, um, you know, it was a construction industry, constant booming, buildings being built. Um, there was a lot of uh, activities going on everywhere. All the architecture offices, especially in Dhaka, was filled with projects by developers. First time, I think, after graduation, I uh, came across this idea of architecture being a commodity, which, at least in school, was not taught. In school, we were more profoundly being thinking about architecture as a balance of poetics and um, rationality, and whereas when I got out, it was something completely different. And I somehow wasn't really very um, easily accepting that fact. And this is one of my trips to Dubai, uh, where I think it just shows by me, I'll change your life forever. Um, architecture changing life forever uh, by being a commodity just did not seem like a right thing to do. And obviously, at that time, you see this fast breed of buildings, steel and glass, instant cities being built. Here you see China being built, uh, being you know brought in, uh, parachuting architecture, fast breed. So, you know, there was a crisis of identity. That's what I felt, especially in Dhaka, where I am based. It seemed like a, a serious crisis because none of the buildings really looked like they belonged to that place. So, in a way, um, as a very young architect, I had to decide which way to go. And obviously, you know, I didn't know which way to go. It was all written in Chinese or Japanese, maybe. Um, the question was whether to indulge in this madness uh, or to take a path of resistance. And you know, whichever the way, it really did not, I did not know uh, where it would take me, but I decided to take that path of resistance and look for something which is, which has a kind of a deeper meaning um, in terms of language of architecture, to create a language of architecture which would belong to that place. And uh, to some extent, except for Mazhar al-Islam, which Billy just mentioned, there were hardly any architects who were really looking into that language, maybe a few. So um, I looked into the place, which I think is the most important element, which is the geography, the topography, the climate, which gives us our identity, our uniqueness. And then, of course, the time, which is the social, cultural, political environment that's constantly evolving and changing and a matrix of both as the context. So I would begin with where I come from, the land and the location. So you see that's Bangladesh, very green. It's right under the Himalayan range. Um, so it's the delta of Ganges and Brahmaputra, two major rivers, which flows from the Himalayas and then flowing into the Bay of Bengal, making it a very fertile ground but at the same time, two-thirds of Bangladesh is actually Delta. And we have about 148,000 square kilometers of land. 
and um, it's a home to 150 million people. So you can imagine the enormous size of population. The country is crisscrossed by more than 700 rivers. And you can see it's almost like veins and arteries in a human body. Um, so it's, it's a dynamics of water and land, which is quite unique, because you cannot really separate the two. There are, it's a very fluid landscape, and uh, the one line cannot be drawn between land and water. So that's something uh, very unique. And of course, these are really mighty rivers, and when they change their courses, uh, the fragile land quite often erodes, and then it emerges in somewhere else. So it's always a constant play of emergence and erosion. And there is a certain kind of impermanence in the livelihood of people. And that impermanence is actually a certain kind of psyche that uh, nobody looks beyond a certain time. So nobody would plan for 50 years or even 100 years. It's only for years that one plans. So that's something also unique. And again, the land which is uh, during the dry season remains dry, which is a agricultural land during monsoon becomes an absolutely covered with water. And um, in a way, we do not distinguish between that. So when it's water, people start uh, fishing, and when it's dry, people do farming. So that's how adapting to the natural system, which is also, also I think, very unique. Now, Tropic of Cancer basically passes through Bangladesh. Um, almost close to Dhaka, making it a subtropical climate. And being subtropical meaning that we have a monsoon season and we also have a, a dry season. So during the monsoon, uh, which is fairly between uh, April till August, uh, this is the time when the wind flows from the south, uh, so it brings in moisture with it, hits the Himalayan range, and creates this rain. And so it's hot and humid, both at the same time. And during the dry season, the wind comes from the Himalayas, so it's much more dry, so there is no rain, but it's very dusty. So that's the kind of climate we have, but it's, the temperature is always quite moderate. It's not really as extreme as here. So I'm basically a very tropical creature. For me, this cold is, <laughs> not something very um, uh, acceptable in a way. <laughs> so, invite me in summer. <laughs> okay, so, um, so basically if you talk about architecture, this is all you need to build or to live in Bangladesh. Uh, that's a kind of a primordial hut, um, a, a pavilion uh, form as architecture. That's all you really require for columns and a roof to protect you from the elements, and a plinth to, to keep you above the water level, and make it as open as possible so that wind can flow. And so the first project which Billy was just mentioning about the Arakan Award uh, as a short, short-listed project, in those days uh, they never uh, revealed the shortlist, so nobody knew about it. But in this project, which we call it Pavilion Apartment, it's a small project where we actually tried that out, opening the edges, blurring the edges in a way so that you can really let the nature into the space. And um, also trying out and working with courtyards, spaces that can actually um, interact with uh, nature. So there is no boundary between in and out. And you know, these kind of courtyards are also something very unique. This is a courtyard where I grew up as a child, so it has always been there in our mind. And it, courtyards are almost like a soul of a house um, in our landscape. So that's something unique. And it also helps in terms of climate because it draws in the air and uh, like stack effect, it just takes out. So it keeps the spaces ventilated, so courtyards really work well and many of my projects I have introduced courtyards to be able to make the building function on its own. 
And where I come from, we do not have the luxury of uh, ample electricity because being a flat delta, we do not produce enough electricity to sustain the entire country. Uh, we use gas, but we also buy electricity from India. So it becomes quite irresponsible when your building do not function on its own. So the building must function without any uh, artificial means. So that becomes one of the major criteria when we are building or designing a project. So this is the section of that building. Talking about materials, uh, this is a monastery from uh, 16th century, but we have Buddhist monasteries from 3rd uh, to 4th uh, century BC. And these are all built with brick. Uh, because we do not have any other material but earth. And so for a long time, that has been the tradition that you take earth, mold it into brick, and you make buildings with uh, brick, baked bricks. So uh, th this is all we have, actually, as a local material. And that's why quite often that's what we use uh, as the most inexpensive material that we can come up with. This is um, one of those terracotta temples that we have, which is also, again, made out of earth, just uh, beautiful terracotta. So earth can do magic, actually, if you want. So a lot of brick projects that I have designed, um, most of them because of the fact that they are all quite often low-budget projects, so it's easier when you go for bricks. And we have really good brick masons uh, coming from the northern part of the country. And quite often, you know, these are unskilled laborers also in the construction industry, and everything is built with hand. So a lot of, be it a 30-story building or a two-story building, it's all made by hand. So you won't see large cranes or anything. People are just climbing with their, with all the materials on their head. So, so handcrafting and the imperfection that comes with handcrafting is something also unique uh, in terms of the language of architecture that is being produced. This is uh, Esharul, one of my people I work with, uh, still do. And he is a wonderful uh, you know, person who can create interesting things. I mean, you can just give him an idea about a, an interesting recipe of a floor, and he will just produce it, uh, be it a terrazzo or even with broken chips or stones. Uh, we have also these porcelain mosaics, which is quite unique as well, and we try to use those. So for them, I mean, since they are not trained, formally trained, uh, drawings produced in the office really doesn't make much uh, uh, effect. So quite often it's about interacting with them on site and doing the drawings with them, uh, trying to understand. And it's always about connection and working closely with the people who are there on the site. And their reality is that it's a country where there is a lot of inequity, disparity, and there is not much opportunity in the villages. So quite often you see people coming from the villages to the city, especially in Dhaka, which is the capital, um, on the train, literally on the train, and then coming and just becoming one of the daily laborers of the uh, construction industry because it does not really require any skill in that sense. And this is this would be where their first um, housing or that's where they would come and stay. So we have these kind of slums where people, uh, uh, you know, informal settlements that's all around the city. So Dhaka, which is the capital, is actually uh, the biggest city in Bangladesh, which has about 20 million people living there, one of the fastest growing cities in the world, one of the densest cities in the world. 
and which is absolutely in the middle of the country, which probably I can show you, probably doesn't go that far, but absolutely in the center you can see. Uh, that's Dhaka, and from Dhaka anywhere in the country is about uh, 300 meters of distance. And the city has grown over the last 20 decades, let's say, it has grown really tremendously. And quite often, because of the density, we are building, we're just stacking floors one top of the other. And we do not have the luxury of making small houses, but generally this is the section that we, all the offices in Bangladesh draw. And this is one of my sections, by the way. Um, so the site is where you see the yellow dot. That's the site. And it is a developer project. I quite often do not work for developers because uh, of the restrictions and the time limitations and the commodifications, which becomes much more um, priority than architecture itself. So I try to avoid. But this project, I did it for two different reasons. One was... Um, uh, it was approached by the landowner who owns the land. And also, secondly, there was a change in the bylaws where uh, they increased the setbacks and, and introduced FAR. So I thought of trying out a different project. And the other reason was this is on the major spine of Dhaka City. So this, the city run, has one single spine which runs from north to south. And this is on the spine. And this road remains busy or let's say jammed throughout the entire day. So what do you do on a site like that? So that was mainly my uh, uh, pursuit in this project. So this is the plan, very basic plan in the sense that you have two, bed, two apartments on two sides as the developers would sell them, the core in the middle. The only thing I probably tried out is opening up the edges on the corners where you have uh, these fins which allows the natural ventilation to take place so that the building can work on its own. Um, it breathes. So that breathability is absolutely an important phenomena that is required for any architectural project we build. So that's the only thing that was introduced. And um, the idea was to give the city a facade which is not really... Uh, Having balconies, that's what generally is the case. But and the developers really wanted them, wanted us to put balconies on, looking onto this road. But we said, no, this is a facade that belongs to the city, and it needs to remain that way. So we kind of fought for that, that the building has that quality that when people are moving on the street, that they do not see the balconies. But the balconies are more to the north and the south. So that's what it is. Uh, that's more the developer's perspective, and that's what the building actually looks like. From the corners. And so I'm just showing you a few projects which are these multi-story, multi-tiered uh, residential projects that we are working on. Here's another site, which is, again, that yellow little dot there. Um, so this is a project which is, uh, the client wanted, uh, it's a residential project belonging to one family, not really um, uh, a developer project, but a private project, but the client has a number of, uh, his, he wants to give each of his son and daughter uh, separate floors. Uh, so it's a family project where the multi-family residential project in a way. And the lower floors would be used for a common facilities like uh, entertaining guests and things like that. So, and the other thing the client wanted us to bring back in a way was uh, these long verandas that we used to have in old houses, uh, especially even from the houses from the 60s even. You find these beautiful long verandas, which actually works like double skin where the air flows in and then it becomes cooler and then it goes into the rooms. And also this space was a very vibrant space. All I can remember from my childhood is there's long houses, long verandas where uh, the entire day was lived. People would just go into the rooms when they're sleeping. But otherwise, 
in in the urban areas, this was a very uh, kind of a unique uh, way of living. So what we did is we introduced these uh, verandas all around the building. We introduced courtyards, and the living spaces are in between. So I'll show you some of the. So the veranda actually runs all around it. This is a project which we, which has just gone into approval process. So it's a new project. That's why I'm showing you. Um, so these are all the. Um, this is what it's looking like. So basically, the veranda is running all around um, and breaking at some points. So. Um, and we sell, we're thinking of creating some uh, vegetation all around the edges so that you can actually sit around and enjoy uh, these uh, spaces. Uh, so this is now, um, it's, it's going to go into construction hopefully this uh, after June. So now it's going through the approval process. So that's a new project. Uh, so I will. I, I I did show this project, the mosque project, which won the Aga Khan Award um, last time. I was giving a talk at the Architecture League, but I thought of showing it again in any case because many people here probably didn't go there, so it was more a Bangladeshi crowd. So I thought of showing it. Uh, so the blue dot that you see, that's the site uh, of the mosque, which is actually. Uh, the northern end of Dhaka city, and it is absolutely the fringe area. Um, and this is my client for the project, my grandmother. And uh, so, you know, it was 2005. One evening, she asked me to come over for tea. I went there, and I saw that she was sitting with her drawings of the map that she owned some lands to the northern part. And she very formally uh, told me that she wants to donate a piece of land to build a mosque, and she wanted me to design and build it. So uh, it was a kind of a, a responsibility given to me uh, from her. So And I accepted, in a way, because obviously any kind of um, religious structure is, is a typology which everybody wants to uh, design, so I really was fascinated by the idea of designing a mosque. So the first, uh, this was the first prayer that took place on the site, and you can see it's a very village-like atmosphere with haystacks, and so we invited the locals to come for a prayer, which is under a jackfruit tree, and you can see my grandmother sitting there in white sari, and so it was declared that this site will become a mosque. And uh, that was 2006, September, and my grandmother passed away in December. So um, she did not really get a chance to see it, but you know, it became even more a uh, pressing responsibility for me to finish the project. So that's how it began. And that's the city of Dhaka, as you can see, the growth. And it is a city that is growing really fast. And these fringe areas, which is absolutely on the edges, are also constantly changing. So from 2004, when the project was introduced, till let's say now, it from I have seen that it has turned from a agricultural land to much more of a settlement, informal in a way because there was no planning as such. So this is a place, I would say, in transformation, constant transformation. So there is nothing predictable what would happen around the site. So that's one uh, challenge. Secondly, uh, this idea of a mosque. And 2004, 2005, it was right after 9-11. There was war going on all around, Muslims and, the, and all these things were being questioned. Uh, so that was a time when also in Bangladesh we've had quite a few different um, uh, things that came up. Uh, so basically, I, 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 it, was, it was sort of a question that I started asking um, in a way um, to sort of hark back to the beginning and question what is a mosque. 
And essentially, a mosque is a place where Muslims congregate uh, to a certain direction, which is Mecca, and pray. And the mosque form uh, from the Prophet's time was actually uh, the gene of the mosque form, let's say, is actually from the house form of the Arabian Peninsula. So there was nothing um, grand about it, but it was a very humble structure to begin with. And it was not just about prayer, but it was also a space where people would gather for different kind of social communal activities. There were a lot of things that took place, but slowly as uh, time went by, it just turned into a space where people would just gather for religious affairs. And as Islam you know, grew and moved from the Arabian Peninsula to the East and West, it took many different forms. And wherever uh, it went, the mosque basically uh, adapted the local culture, the local construction system, um, and so you can see all these different varied forms like uh, the mosque in Turkey or let's say mosque in Cordoba or in Mali or even in Tunisia or let's say a mosque, uh, the Shahi mosque or the Bad Shahi mosque in uh, Delhi uh, from the Mughal times. So basically they have changed or adapted to the different culture that it has embraced. And in, in our Bengal, basically, this is what the form looked like. Um, so Islam came to Bengal in the 15th century. And during that time, uh, during the Sultanate time, this is the most authentic mosque form that you can find. And this is what mosques look like these days. Uh, the stacks of floors, there is no typological invention, nothing, it's just basic space. Uh, there is nothing spiritual about it. And this is probably what has happened to the symbols that you can see. Um, so really, uh, the question is, is it really important to embrace or identify oneself with the symbols? Or is it uh, the spirit of uh, the religion? So I, I basically looked into the spirituality of the entire um, uh, religious affairs and basically uh, looking into light as an inspiration, looking into space as an inspiration. And so if you look at this, some of these older sketches where uh, you see that the site was a square form which was a 75 feet by 75 feet square and then um, the prayer hall needed to be shifted uh, to a certain direction, about 13 degrees, to face the uh, Qibla, which is the me direction to Mecca. And I've tried out different options of doing that, and also looking into all the other different architectural, um, religious architecture forms that existed. So there is the Buddhist monastery, Hindu temple, uh, Naindo mosque, and of course, Khan's parliament, and from all these, basically, this is my uh, conceptual sketch where I had the square site, I introduced a circular volume in the middle, and then which helped me rotate the, or shift, make the shift of the prayer hall. So this is a model, of, a study model that we made. So the central volume that you see is actually the prayer hall. And and there are these corner courtyards or open to sky spaces, which actually helps to ventilate the space. Um, so essentially, the prayer hall is actually a, um, a pavilion, which is on eight columns, and it's wrapped around by the brickwork. And the reason for the brickwork is to keep the cost low. My grandmother did give the land, but and she gives some money to initiate the project, but the rest of the money we had to raise from the locals and the people who live there. So we had to be very responsible about how we uh, use that money that we got as a fund from people. So, and again, this breathing facade uh, so that it actually breathes uh, and takes the 
air in so that it does not rely too much on artificial means. These are our uh, brick masons who did this beautiful project and they are actually also the winners of the award because as you know that the Aga Khan Award actually um, uh, basically give, you know, recognizes everybody's contribution, whoever is involved in the project. And so the Mason's work was definitely one of the best works, and so he was also awarded the award. So basically, it's not just me, but everybody who were involved in the project who got the award. So that's something uh, unique, I think. The sections of the project, you can see the corners. So that's my plan. So you enter from the southern side, uh, where you see these colonnades, and then you do not enter in absolutely directly to the mosque, but you have to take a few bends. The idea is to condition one's mind to be able to, uh, to, for the, to be ready to, for the act of praying. So that's why I did not want people to enter directly. And so these are the drawings. Uh, I basically talked about it, so all the different aspects that I kept in mind uh, while designing this project. So here you see uh, the entire area growing, um, turning into a settlement, construction going on everywhere. So at one point in time, you won't see the mosque anymore because it's it will be completely covered with buildings all around it. And so it was not important to look outside, but to look within. So that's why I think I always say that it's more about looking within than without. And you see the area, basically, uh, it's the lower middle income people living all around people who are migrating from the country more to the city and securing a small plot and building. And these are the people who actually donated money to build the project. And the light that's coming in, and we tried to employ as much as natural uh, elements as possible, so trying to keep it elemental in a way, but at the same time um, keeping it as basic as possible because we did not have the other means, but it's not that I would do it any other way. Um, so you see the play of light, it's basically interesting throughout the year, um, not every day is similar, it just constantly changes with time, with uh, climate with uh, with the different months. So this is one of the time lapse uh, images or video we took. Uh, how the light moves, uh, especially during summer months, because in the winter you won't go get those dot lights. Um, it only appears during when the sun is much higher up, and so the light actually changes through the time. And in a way, it, it acts like a, um, almost like a clock, uh, you know, more like a, you can almost tell the time. So some of the other spaces, and here are the people praying. This project also got Jamil Prize, which is a prize that is done, um, uh, given by VNA. Uh, so. This is one of those videos that they did. I'll just, I'll just show it to you. I'm very passionate about what I do, and I know that if I want to do something uh, of architecture, this is where it should be. Light for me is a beautiful material to work with. If you can use it properly, how you bring in the light, the openings and apertures, I think it can make it spiritual, it can make it very contemplative. All these different aspects are something to do with feelings. 
if the space or the architecture is able to capture you, to connect with you, to create a dialogue with you, that will stay with you forever. Modernity is everywhere, but to make it of a place, it's important to understand where you are. The climate, the people, the culture, history. I get my ingredients for design from these elements. When you have a humid climate like ours, the most important thing is the airflow. My buildings need to breathe. I like to work with brick. It has a beautiful, graceful way of aging. And aging is important in architecture. I wanted to bring back that idea of mosque as not just a space for praying, but also more like a community center. They get enriched by it, they get empowered by activities that are taking place within that space. The building brings in that enormous feeling of spirituality that is to connect with whatever you want to connect with. To connect with God, connect with nature, connect with the sun, however you want to put it. So it's that connection is there. So after the Aga Khan Award, we had this event which, where we invited all the um, community people, so they all came in and we turned the prayer hall into a space where people can actually uh, have a nice, decent lunch. And that's also something I think would be interesting to see a space which, is, uh, which can be used in many different ways especially in a city like Dhaka, where you hardly have any space where people can gather. So to use a space only for five times a day it just doesn't seem like the right uh, amount of use. So, so we are trying to generate more ways of using that space. The space is sort of like a refuge in a busy, very busy, um, very dense urban situation where people can just come in and spend some time or even holding a small community event so that it has multiple way of using it so this activities needs to be generated in those spaces uh, this is an exhibition which we had also so it also could be used as an exhibition space so these are the different kind of activities that i hope this project can actually uh, become an example of uh, the next project, now I've shown you some projects which are absolutely in the city of Dhaka. This was more in the fringe areas. Now I'm taking you absolutely out of Dhaka city, which is more to the south of Bangladesh. And this is the last project. So uh, this is the south of Bangladesh, which is more, uh, you can see the uh, Bay of Bengal. And the dark area is actually the mangrove forest known as Shundarbon where the Royal Bengal Tigers live. So one of the projects, which is the resort, uh, uh, which is named Panigram Resort, which you can see over there, uh, it, was, uh, it was absolutely in the Delta, so the client wanted to make a resort which would be socially, environmentally responsible project and also uh, gives people or the guests a very authentic uh, feeling or experience of uh, being in the Delta. So if you look at it, the site and the surrounding, it's absolute agriculture land. And there are villages, which is the dense areas over there. You can see that those are the villages surrounding the site area. And um, so it's a completely different kind of a landscape. So once you get out of the Dhaka city, it is really a beautiful country. And um, so that's also, that's the view of the site. And from the site, this is what you see. So there's a river, which is Kopotakko. That river flows right next to the site. And surrounding the site are agricultural lands, really fertile ground, Bangladesh. As you know, it's a delta and very fertile alluvial soil. So we get three crops a year. And these areas are the areas which actually feed the entire country. 
and our agriculture is still in a very primitive way. Cows are the tools uh, that are used. So, um, in a site like this, uh, you know, what can an architect like me build? That was my first question or the dilemma with this project was that am I really equipped to design something in a site like this? Um, so, the first site visit, uh, this is what I kind of came up with, that rural Bangladesh is uniquely beautiful. Soul of the Delta land, it feels like a crime to invade this silence with the roaring noise of architecture. So what we did was uh, we started uh, looking into the land and how people build. And if you see here, you see that it's basically a flat land, so people dig ponds, they take the earth, they create a mound, and on the mound they basically place their houses. Uh, so it's creating a certain kind of undulation where uh, the water can go into one space, uh, which is the pond, and keeps the ground clear. So this is how they have been living for centuries. And mud being the being in the delta, that's the only uh, construction material that has always been there, and thatch roof. So we have some interns coming from the Cornell University, summer interns who went there, and we basically extensively uh, documented all the villages that are surrounding the site. And so if you see, look at this, this is the elements of the household uh, that are there. And these elements are basically clustered around courtyards, and these courtyards are not really defined courtyards, but just flows from one to the other. So, and very unique because uh, this is where life is lived. So the courtyards are really beautiful, social space, communal space. And this is how the entire village is created. So you see the villages, absolutely a cluster of courtyards moving from one to the other. So this is one of those villages, which is the uh, potter and the yeah, fisherman's village. And these are some of the people uh, who are, who has, over time, become really close to us. Uh, this is the bamboo weavers village. And so, and these are the people from the bamboo weavers. So the landscape and the household is quite unique. So that was also something important for us to deal with um, in terms of creating an architecture. And this is again another very interesting form, which is the bangla roof, or the uh, the roof form, which is very unique in Bengal, which you can see also the Mughals have taken uh, in their own architecture. So that roof form you don't see anymore. So we thought of reviving that roof form. And the idyllic image of a child's mind, any child in Bangladesh, if you ask them to draw a village, this is the kind of image they would draw. So that's the idyllic image. We looked into the, uh, all the different uh, textures and the elements that are available on site. And so that's our site. And you can see the river and two rivers on two sides. And then that's the yellow line shows our uh, regular route to the site. Uh, the plan which you see on your left-hand side was my before the pre-struggle period when I thought of more architectural way of dealing with it. But once I went to the site, and me, I was born and brought up in Dhaka, so I've never been to the villages really in that sense. So I am myself a foreigner in my own country. So once I went there, and it turned into something completely different as an experience. And so then I started embracing more the local culture. And um, what we did is we created uh, an architecture which was very much um, based or taken from the land. So these are some of the bungalows and the images of the bungalows. And we tried to cluster them in a way that it creates those spaces surrounding it. And uh, so the project is basically built with mud, uh, almost 30 inches thick mud walls. And uh, we have thatch roof and bamboo and wood as structure. And the other thing what we did in this project is we introduced, we included the local villagers to come and uh, work with us. So the villagers actually uh, are the main workforce in doing the construction. 
because mud is not my material. I've never worked with mud before. So the, all the recipes of mud, how it works, this is all taken from the locals. Um, and the way the roof is done, uh, obviously we do not have any knowledge. So we basically sourced uh, people from the local locality who would be able to create those roofs for us. And these young men, especially, they always, you know, they uh, study in villages and schools in the villages, and then they're always aspiring to go to the city and maybe find a job there. So what we did is we tried to keep them or engage them in their own location and try to give them work so that they become a major force. So he's a potter's son, so that's their landscape. And um, and in a, in Interestingly, he or most of his generation has no interest in pottery because it doesn't bring any money. So that was another thing, that how you can bring back that pride which is lost. So, um, so we basically engaged the entire uh, village people to come up and come and do the project with us. We did not employ the local construction method of earth, but we brought in sun-dried mud bricks to build, and we used basically wood and bamboo and thatch. And you can see all the villagers. And this is a technique which is rarely being used anymore, so we had to really source these people who can come and actually weave the uh, thatching of the roof. And these thatches are only found from the, uh, the forest, the Shundarbon, where uh, the government allows uh, these palm leaves to be cut at a certain time of the year because they overgrow. So we have to procure those at, during that time. And we have a lot of women also working on our site because women do the best plaster. And so you can see them uh, taking a break after their work. So it's really a very interesting atmosphere where people come together and actually build. So you don't see architecture, and I don't know if it is architecture, whether you would, we can always debate about that, but to me, in that location, that seemed to be the right answer. So that's what it is looking like. During the dry season, the water goes down, and during monsoon, the water again really fills up. So it has this own, its own natural phenomenon. So, um, so this uh, this project it hasn't gone into. I mean, it's we finished part of the construction. It's still not ready to accept guests, but uh, we are still waiting for the hospitality partner to be on board. So, but we've built a few of the bung. I mean, most of the bungalows are built already, um, and the villagers take part in doing these drawings. Uh, so it's basically that. So, in a way, I don't know, uh, we would probably have a debate about its relevancy as an architecture or whether I should be presenting it or not. But what we've done, actually, is once you finish a project like this and the villagers are already done with the construction, what do, what do they do? So what we've done is we have created something called Panigram Community Initiative, where um, uh, we have engaged or we've asked the, the owners of the project to do certain activities with the villagers like craft diversification workshops, which we have done a few, where uh, they already have certain skills, so basically diverting those skills to create things which would be useful uh, for them to sell to the uh, guests uh, of the resort. And then we've also created these savings groups where women in 20, uh, let's say in a group uh, of 20 or 25, they put in uh, one dollar uh, a week, so which means $25 a week per group. And so within the last two years, they have actually collected a good sum of money and then the resort is also giving an uh, equal amount of money to create a seed fund and with that, uh, they can actually loan themselves um, 
money to do many different things like, you know, like marriage of their daughter or son or even for education, for health. And, um, and so this is how it's a process that we have introduced where we are also helping them build their own environment, own, own houses. Um, one of the projects which is already have built about 40 houses, uh, which is almost an hour's drive from our location, uh, where it's a place called Jinaida, where we've done the similar process uh, uh, by the community architects group, where uh, basically the process starts with engaging them by creating maps of their own place. So the maps that I showed you, hand-drawn maps, are all uh, drawn or, or created by the villagers themselves. So the, now they have a proper map, which they never had. They never knew what was, they knew their boundaries, uh, uh, basically, of course, but they did not have a proper drawing that showed that. Then uh, we engaged them in a process of co-creation where they make their own models. You can see that white model is an aspirational model by the villager themselves, and then the lower part is the houses that were built. So these are $1,500 home projects. So these, uh, these, these include two bedrooms, and a bathroom in $1,500. So my studio at GSD, uh, which was in 2017 uh, fall, uh, this was the project that I introduced for my studio where the students were to design uh, $2,000 home houses. And $2,000 actually in a village context like Bangladesh is three cows and a goat. Uh, that's a goat, by the way, not a dog. <laughs> so um, that's so my studio actually went uh, to Bangladesh. They visited some of these $1,500 projects. Uh, they went around and saw the site. Uh, they also took part in understanding the materials. So they did some uh, hands-on projects to understand what materials are available and how the construction industry actually works, uh, working with the local masons and you know so these are some of the projects that they did and since we introduced this idea of co-creation where the client and the architect actually comes together and talk about uh, the ideas and it's the aspiration of the client which is more important than what the architect thinks should be uh, built uh, especially in this situation where the client actually made their own models. They told the architects where they want, what they want. So basically, it's, a, it's two different people coming together. One has an idea. The other one has the technological knowledge. So coming together and creating something interesting. So that's one client. So we had five different clients, real clients, um, who will be building their houses by taking loan of $2,000 from that seed fund that they already have. And um, so the students were divided and they went and talked to the clients. Um, as you can see, it's the studio final presentation. And then the, stu the drawings of the studio students' work were taken to the villages and we made a, uh, also an exhibition on, on, on the, in the village. So these are some of the design works that the students did. And then when, when we took it to the uh, villages, from the 13 studio works, they actually chose five, uh, which would be built. Uh, we were supposed to build it this December, but we had election in Bangladesh, so we had to defer it. Hopefully, we will be building it soon. Um, so five of the projects will be getting built. So this was also the project which I uh, uh, kind of took that idea and did the Venice Biennale installation that we did in uh, last year's Biennale, which was um, themed free space. And free space, as we know, I mean, there was one thing that actually attracted my attention, which was free space going beyond the visual choreographing the daily life. And I thought that the courtyard of a Bengali hut would be the best example to, to show. And uh, the, the installation that I, I called Wisdom of the Land, because uh, as I mentioned, that when I went there to the site, 
being almost like a foreigner, what I first thing that struck me was that there is so much wisdom in living in the land. And those wisdoms are somehow not being appreciated enough and people are forgetting them. People don't have pride of that place anymore. So this is something we need to actually really preserve. So if we see, especially in our time when information runs supreme, so basically there is a difference between information and wisdom and it's a it's a, quite a few tiers that are there. Information with experience becomes knowledge. And then knowledge over a period of time going through this uh, evolution then becomes actually wisdom. And it would be really uh, sad to lose these wisdoms that exist in the land. And this is what happens when you cross um, information with wisdom. So you just goes completely some, somewhere else. What I find is more unique, and I think in a way Mazar islams words are much more uh, goes with this, because um, you see local way of cooking, which is the mud stove, and you have pressure cooker, which is much more a, a, you know, a universal way of cooking. And in a village like Bangladesh, this is how people use it, so that's what a unique wisdom, in a way. So um, that's my site. Those are the uh, drawing we did. So what we did is we tried to create a courtyard. And we basically sourced all the different elements, which are, in a way, a reflection of the wisdom of people's living in the land. Uh, these are granaries. And this is the lady who actually donated her own granary, and she made it herself. And you can see that in Venice. Um, these are all the different people who, who made their own household utensils and we basically took them and um, placed them in a, in a space which is a courtyard. And that's a boat, by the way. Uh, it's made out of a, a palm tree trunk, which also you can see here in Venice. And that's a grinder a really large grinder. Um, these are day beds, which is quite common in the city. Uh, we took some of the things from the uh, potters. And the steel structures that actually creates that environment is, we actually built it in Bangladesh, uh, absolutely plug, plugging them in so that it's easy to take, take it there and just place it. So we finished our entire installation in a day. So that's what it looked like. Basically, the buildings are invisible. You don't see them anymore. They're just lines. And what is more prominent are the, uh, the daily usable utensils, which are already uh, used by people. So it really creates an, it created an atmosphere of, um, of a courtyard where you can actually go and sit and, and enjoy the space. So, um, well, after the installation was done, which was in December last year, um, TU Berlin actually took the entire installation and they have uh, acquired the entire thing for their natural building lab because it just didn't make any sense to bring them all back to Bangladesh. It was just too much money. So that's my uh, presentation. I'll just end it with a small video where it actually shows our activities in the villages. Um, and I'll probably just tell you what it, what goes on there. So that's the harvest harvesting season. the resort. 
you can see the, all the villages that are surrounding the site. And these are the villages we actually uh, are working with. They generally make these utensils uh, which they sell in the markets which people generally use. But we are trying to uh, diversify that to make more uh, products which are which they can actually earn money with like even for export That's also another thing that uh, they aspire for brick houses. They don't want to live in mud houses anymore because in a way um, they think mud houses are for poor people and as they move um, economy with, you know, they have better income, they want to move to a uh, brick house. So this is the process of um, community mapping which we actually do with children and also young um, boys and girls so basically they start by drawing on the on the earth and then they start so basically they put their houses where they are located and they measure them and all the maps are being created by themselves so that's uh, now they have all proper drawings of their own land this is the savings group where they have their meetings and they collect the money um, and we also at times take uh, take students and for some awareness programs like trash and plastic. This is the craft diversification workshop. This is a product designer who's a very well known product designer in Bangladesh. So he basically went and gave um, different kind of. Uh, ideas and how they can really work with their own material and create something different. And here they're working with the bamboo weaver. Thank you, that was fantastic. Oh, and then we just going to have uh, a couple of questions, I think perhaps from the audience, but I'm going to start off with a couple of questions. Mostly I just wanted to sit up here with two other great women. <laughs> so, but one of the things um, that I think we've all had in common as an experience is to uh, be on the jury of the Aga Khan Prize. And I think you're both on the steering committee after being on the jury. Um, and I was wondering if you had um, any observations about things that surprised you or that you learned by looking at the work that was um, presented to the jury. Well, I was never in the jury. Um, I'm just in the steering committee, so I, I wouldn't be able to tell maybe it's Bridget who should be answering that. 
one of the things that happens is that you see um, a lot of projects that serve the Muslim world. And in a way, they serve everyone. Um, and this round, I would say, uh, we actually did see all of the projects. Um, I think the jury has already met, and I haven't seen the list, but there are 20 shortlisted projects. And the range of issues that they take on are pretty amazing. Um, this question of rural and urban, which I think is very well uh, documented in, the, in Marina's lecture, is a really big global issue. The question of densification of our cities and how we deal with that. I actually just spent two days on AIA New York Chapter Design Awards, and this question of density and innovative ways of addressing density is a global question. So I would say many of the kind of projects of the award really um, tackle um, important issues that all architects have to be thinking about. And uh, so I feel that um, the, these are really um, uh, essential for us to be focusing on and for us to have um, really great design solutions to be addressing. Well, one of the, um, I guess one of the questions I had been planning to ask before I saw the presentation of your work, and I do think in the, in the sort of words of Islam, you are a very proper architect, because I've actually never seen a practice that's quite like yours, and so deeply embedded um, in the culture. So I was going to say, how, what are the difficulties of building in Bangladesh, in Dhaka? But pairing along with that is, what are the benefits and the wonderful things um, about building in Bangladesh and Dhaka? Well, um, I think the challenges are quite uh, different than many other places because you know you have a dense um, and, and, and a, a big population that's one uh, the resources are limited um, quite often the project do not have enough budget so you need to become innovative in many different ways um, to include those and in a way for me I think uh, challenges and uh, these kind of um, you know, not having enough resource and, you know, every building needs to function on its own. These are the challenges, I think, that makes the architecture unique in a way and it also makes you go beyond your um, comfort zone and try to be innovative in a different way. So that's what is unique in a way, uh, as I would say, a positive thing about uh, doing architecture. And there is so much of elements there that you can actually take in and create something interesting. Uh, but at the same time, um, the challenges are that you have, a, uh, you have to work in a construction industry where people are not really skilled. So you need to be really involved uh, in the entire process from designing till the building ends. So it's a, it's a constant uh, connection that's also very at times rewarding, at times challenging, I think. Well, it's interesting in the reduction of possibilities that there's the possibility of going deeper. You take this one. It just doesn't like you, Bridget. <laughs> um, I really enjoyed the lecture, and I felt I learned so much about the place that you practice in. And one of the things you described was design-build. And in a way, in all North American architecture schools, it's, it's a kind of very common thing, and each design build studio takes it on in quite different ways. But I would say when you describe design build, it has a very expanded definition. And I was really struck by the fact that, you know, an architect is a community builder, an architect is a social entrepreneur, an architect is actually involved in product design and financing. So I felt the kind of, it's such an expanded definition, whereas a North American architect kind of does certain things, and a client does certain things, and I feel like the kind of crossing over of boundaries is actually one of the really uh, wonderful aspects that, that you were able to share with us. 
And I guess, um, I mean, how, like, in a way, I felt like the rural project, this, this happened in such an expansive way. And maybe this kind of question of how you build in a rural context relative to how you build in an urban city like Dhaka, and maybe comparing the kind of opportunities and challenges in both would be really interesting to... Well, you know, uh, I think from the, as I mentioned, that from the very beginning of my practice, that's what struck me most is that, um, you know, we grew up uh, seeing this inequity, this disparity among people. Um, you know, you have very rich people in a country where there are also people who do not have enough. So this has always been um, an important driving force. So if you have a practice which is more a service rendering profession where you have, let's say, 1% of the entire Bangladesh able to actually hire me as an architect, pay me my fees and uh, you know, and I could actually build what they want, and I do have clients like that, but at the same time, there is always this pressing um, and a constant understanding, and, 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 and I feel the need that, that you need to also give back to the society, to the people who are, who are, we cannot as a profession reach out to. And how do you do that? So in many ways, when uh, we have a project, uh, we try to employ people or who are craftsmen who can actually add value to the project but at the same time be benefited and also um, keeps a certain kind of a crafting um, still alive. So that's one issue. When you go to the villages, obviously, I'm designing a resort which will probably be uh, per night it will go more than $300 a night. So that's a high-end resort project. Um, but at the same time, uh, we do not want it to be sort of a gated place where you just bring in people who are rich and able to afford and, and just put them in a sort of a cage. But uh, we want this entire thing to sort of expand horizontally going into the villages so that the people who are living around it also benefit. So there is a certain kind of a sense of ownership also among the villagers that they also become part of the entire process. So, you know, that's how, you know, as architects, we are kind of limited within our boundary of the site. And we cannot become social reformers <laughs> by just being in the site. So in whatever possibility or in whatever way it's possible, we try to um, engage in different ways of, um, and also trying to convince the clients that, that it's also our social responsibility to, to create these opportunities for people. Um, are there any questions from people in the audience? There's one. There's, do you want to come to the mic or do you prefer to stand up and yell? Yes. state the question just through the So um, you're basically asking if it's in an urban context, how would we engage people? Is that what you're asking? Well, uh, well, in the, uh, in, the, in the context of urban, urban context, we basically try to bring in uh, people like, uh, you know, all the uh, crafting that we've, we've already done that in a number of projects, like, um, you know, those who had, I mean, we have a number of interesting samples as well that we kind of prepare uh, to find out which actually goes well. But I think the uh, mosque project is actually a good example, like how you can actually engage people who are 
locals who live there uh, in a way that, um, you know, they funded the project themselves, those who live in that location. So uh, when you include them in, t in the process, um, as I mentioned, that there is a sense of ownership. And once you build a project like this mosque, let's say, or once it's built um, and it's done and I'm out of that scene, right? So it's up to the people to actually preserve it, to look after it. And if there is a sense of ownership, then they really look after it well because they own it. And, uh, and in, in many ways, the, that's what has happened with the mosque, that they actually look after it really well and they're very proud of the project. So I think in the entire process of construction, if you can include, especially if it's a public project or project where uh, it's for a mass or a, or a community, that's how it can be done. And if you're asking about, I don't know if you want to talk about, um, I mean, in, especially in urban areas, you cannot find skilled people living together like a community as you see in the villages. So I do not know how you can do that. But definitely there are people who are skilled in different kind of crafting, uh, in building craft, which was there initially. So you can still find them and you can always use them in you know, creating your own different ideas and details. Um, this question here. You mean the small holes, the tiny little, <laughs> the dots? For, for those of you ha who didn't hear, the question was uh, to explain what the small openings were in the ceiling of the mosque project, or how you did that. So we wanted, you know, uh, this is a very basic project where we didn't have much fund, um, no ornamentation, and people always aspire for ornament, especially in places like this. So this is our little ornament, in a way. So the ornament is that when we were casting the roof um, in between the reinforcement, wherever we had, we just basically created a circular pattern. And then wherever we could find some space, we put some plastic glass uh, filled with uh, uh, sand so that it doesn't get filled. So basically a very primitive way of doing it. But then we casted the roof, then we took it out, we had those smaller holes, and then we uh, sealed it with glass on top. So it is sealed, there is no water leaking, but you get a beautiful light, which is actually the ornament of the space. Oh, sorry, there and there, and then probably we'll close the evening down, but got two more questions. Thank you. Uh, no. <laughs> Sorry. Say it again. So. Yeah. Right. Ah, uh, oh, yeah, well, oh, goodness, yes, I now understand. So, <laughs> so we have scaffoldings, right? So we basically have either bamboo scaffoldings or nowadays we are a little better, we have steel scaffoldings, but then you have... Um, uh, bamboo stairs, like a ramp, that's generally they create. And then uh, people basically uh, carry it, um, you know, from ground to top. Or, uh, and, or otherwise, when you have number of floors, you uh, start from, from lower level, and then you take things to a certain level up. And then that's how it's done. So, um, yeah, it's all human. <laughs> um, I think the last question was here. Uh, there's another one behind oh, the. Okay, uh, there's another column. one <laughs> you can't see. Okay, one, two. Whoops. 
Yeah, I understand what you mean. <laughs> so, um, well, the mosque project definitely it was my grandmother's project, so obviously there was no fee. <laughs> but um, uh, the uh, resort, of course, we are paid by the uh, client. And um, these extra things that we do, uh, especially with the community, which is not part of our main brief, but we do it because of a sense of uh, social uh, responsibility, which is actually, again, partly funded by the uh, client themselves because they wanted it to be a very socially, environmentally responsible project. So that was from the very beginning in the brief. And so we kind of engaged them, or we told them that this would be a, a responsible thing to do, that you empower your um, um, surrounding villages. So that's how it, it, it was not a difficulty to do that. Um, so you need to find out ways. Like, you know, we have to at times balance. Like some of the projects pay well enough to sustain the office and, and the other activities. And some of the things we do because we uh, want to give back to the society, especially considering the country I come from, where I really enormously feel that we need to give back to the society a lot more. Because, and you know, it's Bangladesh. I don't. I mean, it's quite unique to say that we were educated free. I mean, we went to university. The government paid for us in a country like Bangladesh where even in the U.S. you don't have that. So, um, so it, when that happens, you really feel a sense of responsibility that you need to do more for the people. So that's how we try to balance in many different ways. So, yeah. Okay, I'm calling it quits with these two people in front of the column. So I was talking more about the uh, village project where, you know, villagers don't need architects, very true. They can build their own things. They have been doing that for ages, centuries. They don't even know what architects do, who architects are, why do they, you know, just do drawings. They don't even know how to make things. So, um, so basically, uh, it is actually making ourselves available in a way to expand our professional, uh, uh, you know, boundary, not to be restricted within 1% or 2% of population, but to make ourselves available and our knowledge available to people who can actually benefit from it. And the villagers do benefit from it because we have the technical know-how. Like as I was mentioning, they want to have brick houses, but for Ages, ages they have been building with mud. They do not know how to build with brick. So they just hire some um, kind of, a, not even contractor, a mason, and they would tell them, make me a room. And they make a five inch brick work, which is neither structurally proper, nor climatically correct. So when you go there with that similar amount of material that they have, as architects, we have the capacity to to actually give more than what they can actually produce. So to make ourselves available, that's what was the main agenda. So you cannot just go and, you know, be the dictator and just tell them this is what you do. There you have to have a certain kind of a respect with which you address people. And that's why we created this idea of co-creation where people say and talk about their aspiration and you value that aspiration and you design accordingly so that you become more acceptable by people. Okay, last question there.
well. I always, especially I tell my students, my, you know, young architects, quite often they come abroad, go and study, do higher studies. I always tell them, come back, you know. I mean, there's far more, uh, it's much more rewarding to be in, let's say, where you are and and make meaningful contribution. And it's so much more rewarding than, you know, building a, let's say, a, a five, a, you know, 12-story residential building for a developer, really. Um, so I think they understand that. We have this community architects group who works with me in these village projects. Um, they go and stay in the villages, and mostly women, actually, uh, all girls. And, and, and they have really wonderful uh, relationship that has they have built up, not just the villages surrounding the site, but there are other villages um, where they, there's some villages they work in the northern part where you know Anna's projects are. So there are some villages there where they work with. So they are they are like spread out all over Bangladesh, and they call themselves community architects. They don't earn much. Uh, we try to sustain them as different ways as possible, but I think there is this um, uh, this feeling among, especially younger architects, which I see, and which I think is a very positive thing that they really want to work with people. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, and thank you, Bridget. <laughs> yes, thank you, Bridget. <laughs> thank you.